our skies are capable of unleashing terrible fury. Throughout the seasons, they bring catastrophe in the form of cyclones and torrential rain in the springtime, heat waves in summer, hurricanes in the fall, and snowstorms through the long winter. There is no place on Earth spared these disasters with their devastating consequences. And now, with climate change, these extreme events are growing all the more punishing and more and more frequent. In the face of these catastrophes, weather forecasters and scientists are swinging into action as meteorology reinvents itself. Never in the history of this science have so many research projects been undertaken and so much technology deployed. Meteorologists are scrutinizing clouds, wind, sea currents, and waves like never before. And as their missions take them from the depths of the ocean to the highest levels in the troposphere, an incredible race against time has begun. The year is punctuated by weather events. Winter brings its storms, and with them, the challenge to meteorologists to predict which coastlines will be hit and what the risk will be to local populations. The lives, safety, well-being, and economic activity of millions depend on their forecasting skills. Today, meteorological monitoring and forecasting are critical for our very existence. But how do we predict the weather? For a long time, the mechanisms determining the weather were a mystery. Until, that is, the invention of the satellite. The launch during the 1990s of the two first satellites in the Met Op constellation revolutionized this science, allowing us to observe our planet from space. Before, we only had geostationary satellites at an altitude of 36,000 kilometers, which only showed the equatorial regions. With MedOp, we can travel around the Earth and see it all, including the poles. And we are at 840 kilometers, so we're much lower and can take pictures and much more precise measurements. For its third launch, the MedOp satellite was transported to Kourou in Guyana to be blasted into space on a Soyuz rocket. And everyone involved in its design and production met up in Darmstadt, Germany, to watch. Space is never easy, and a launch is never relaxing. Anything can happen, good and bad, and we have to be ready for anything. Satellite launches are rare events. In the UMITSAT control room, the tension and anxiety among the technicians who will soon be operating MEDOP is palpable. I always bear in mind on a night like this a quote from Alan Shepard, who was the first American into space. And his quote was, dear God, please don't let me fuck up. <laughs> don't fuck up.
It's wonderful to see all the technology behind a satellite launch. And in the end, we benefit because we receive all the data. It just happens. We don't need to think about it. But when you see all the technology behind it, it's absolutely fantastic. Today, 80% of the data used by weather forecasters comes from satellites. But these instruments, which only see a very small part of the Earth as they move, are still too few and far between. There are only 16 weather satellites in orbit around the planet. And there are also around 60 research satellites that supply information to forecasting centers. Weather forecasting has become a global challenge requiring huge resources. And climate change is only adding to the difficulties. Scientists are continuing their quest for understanding across the globe. When the ball drops in Times Square, the wind chill could be minus four. I have never felt the cold like I'm feeling it in these last few days. For the past few years, waves of cold weather have been regularly hitting the US, Europe, and Japan. But what is the reason for these events? According to some scientists, Arctic warming could be the culprit for this shift. Unfortunately, this geographical zone is difficult to access, and it is rare to obtain meteorological data from there. Meteorologists have understood that to improve their forecasting, they need to better represent this region in their modeling. This is the start of an ambitious scientific adventure from Iceland across to Greenland. The campaign, overseen by the World Meteorological Organization, is deploying a level of equipment that has never been used in this region before. The Alliance, a 100-meter-long oceanographic boat, will be home to dozens of scientists from around the world. It has been kitted out with all the latest oceanographical, acoustic, and meteorological technology. For this mission, the British Antarctic Society is using Alpha Zulu, an aircraft specially designed to fly in polar regions. It can measure wind and turbulence, sea temperature, particles in the clouds, and the sunlight filtering through the atmosphere. I mean, the trouble is it, it isn't very windy. The main goals of the project are to find out more about the climate system in the Iceland and Greenland seas. So this is a region where the atmosphere and the ocean are tightly coupled. They talk to each other. Uh, this is a, an important component of the main ocean circulation and key for climate for northwest Europe. There's another very important aspect of this, and, and that is to help improve the, the ability to forecast weather. And, and, and uh, you know, the Arctic is changing drastically, I mean, incredibly fast, you know. Yet it's such a data-poor region, so we need data to understand better uh, how to do things like forecast weather in, in high latitudes. And uh, I would contend that um, not only is it data-poor, but in, in wintertime, it's almost data-barren. <laughs> Until recently, few scientific programs have been carried out in this part of the world. The extreme weather here makes observation campaigns particularly challenging, and it is very difficult to set up instruments for measuring. Robert Pickard and Ian Renfrew have had to wait eight months to begin this project and finally set sail.
right from the start, the realities of the Arctic are having a profound effect on everyone. The long and difficult task of taking measurements and samples begins as they start trying to uncover the mysteries of the Arctic. Okay, this is the balloon. The wind direction is this direction. We're gonna get it out, open this flap, get it out, walk there, and give it to Chris, and he will let it go. New tools have been specially developed by the meteorologists. A prototype submarine drone is being launched for the first time. It should measure the marine currents it encounters between the surface of the ocean and a depth of 1,000 meters. Data like this has never before been captured. Okay, um, I'm gonna go inside and get on the radio and uh, I'll let you know when to green plug it. Okay, you do too. The Arctic currents the drone will measure are key to our terrestrial mechanisms. They govern the circulation of global ocean currents and thus of our weather. In Nordic seas, the waters cool under the influence of the atmosphere. They become denser and descend into abysses and head towards the equator. As they move south, they mingle with the waters they encounter, heating up and returning to the surface before heading north again. This heat redistribution is crucial for the life of our planet. So this program is looking at one aspect of that big overturning loop. It's looking at where the water gets dense, where it sinks, how it sinks, and how it gets into that deep current. That's what we're looking for, and that's why we need to be here in winter during the coldest time of the year. For more than two months, the Research Vessel Alliance and the Alpha Zulu Plain will measure the heat exchanges that are produced from the depths of the ocean to the highest levels in the atmosphere. Flight after flight, and from one destination to the next, the meteorologists hope to find an explanation for the key to changes occurring in the Arctic. It will take several weeks of very hard work before the Arctic starts to reveal its secrets. Some point. 